Anand Mahadevan, associate editor of the Economic Times, encourages explorers like himself in this message with his journey to the truth. All right, morning, everyone. Thank you once again for being with us on this special Sunday. Uh, we have with us a very special guest, Anand Mahadevan. Uh, he's had an amazing career as a business journalist, uh, seen tremendous success early on in his uh, professional journey. And yet, the most amazing part of that whole journey is his discovery of truth. And so we've invited Anand Mahadevan. Uh, he lives in Mumbai with his family there. And uh, he continues as a business journalist. And he's, he's uh, accepted our invitation this morning to come and just talk to us, not only about his professional journey, not only about his journey in life, but his journey to truth. So let's put our hands together. Welcome, Anand Mahadevan. Thank you so much, Anand, for being with us. Good morning, everyone. Such a joy to be here. I guess some of you are here for the first time. I saw a few people stand up. And among those of you who stood up, I would imagine that this is perhaps, at least for some of those of you who stood up, this is probably your first experience in a church kind of a setting. So allow me to use a word uh, to describe you. You might want to use that word to describe yourself. I'd like to call you explorers. That's, that's probably what has brought you here. Maybe I'm sure a friend invited you, perhaps. Uh, but you've come because you're willing to explore. To explore calls for a sense of adventure. To explore calls for a courage. It calls for a fearlessness. And I want to celebrate that in you today. To explore calls for an open mind. To explore uh, calls for a sense of uh, not being afraid of being uncomfortable. And I want to celebrate that uh, in all of us who are exploring this morning. You may be exploring God. You may be exploring Jesus. But you want to celebrate uh, celebrate you. Um, if this is, again, your first time in a church kind of a setting, maybe the music was new. Maybe the, uh, the songs were new. Maybe the, the words were new. But, but I'd like to believe that your heart understood what was happening. Because worship is the language of the soul. Your mind may not have understood all the words. It may have. But I'm willing to bet that your heart understood what is happening here. Because worship is a language of the soul. And this morning, I want to encourage you to continue exploring. I know what it is like to be an explorer. I was once an explorer. I come from a Hindu uh, Brahmin background. And, and even though I was brought up in a very traditional, very orthodox family, my grandfather was a priest in a temple. I remember very early on in my life, uh, I wanted to explore new ways and new ideas and new things. And somehow in, in my heart, uh, the religion of my parents, I loved them. And I loved my grandfather. And we had a beautiful relationship going. Uh, but I wanted to explore. Somehow, uh, the way he worshipped, I just was unable to connect with that. And I, I remember exploring many things. A lot of the things that I explored were good, but, but sadly, I, I, I also explored plenty of things which were not good at all, and I got into a lot of trouble uh, uh, growing up. But I'm so thankful that that exploration, the spirit of exploration that God gave in me as a gift enabled me to discover Jesus one day. I still remember, I was still in college, this was 1993, and um, and a friend of mine invited me home to pray. I went. And he said a simple prayer, very simple prayer. And at the end of the prayer, when he finished and he prayed in Jesus' name, I just felt captivated 
by Jesus in my heart. I knew in my heart that very moment that I had to follow Jesus. And that's how my journey with Christ Jesus began in, uh, in 1993. Uh, so if you're exploring today, um, enjoy this time of exploration. And, and I hope this talk is uh, as helpful to you as, as the time of worship and the time of music was. I, I, was, I, I really enjoyed the time of worship. I, I was really blessed. I was led to worship Jesus uh, by all, uh, all the songs. You know, Psalm uh, 33 says, Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. I can do two of those three things. I can uh, sing to the Lord a new song. In fact, I can only sing new songs. Every song I sing, however old it is, is always a new song because I can never sing the same song in the same tune more than once. It's a unique gift that I have. Some people say I'm musically challenged. My wife says that a lot. I don't think she has the ability to discern uh, the, you know, the, the taste. You know, so... So sometimes my wife and I, we we worshiping and praying, and, and I'm so blessed in that time of worship and prayer that I burst into, into a new song. It always is a new song. And then she, was, she, was also, she would also be praying, but suddenly I would se sense silence from her. And I would be wondering, maybe she's just so filled in the Holy Spirit, or she's slain in the Spirit, or something like that. I, I would open my eyes and see, and, and she would be staring at me. I would say, what happened? And she'd say, Anand, I'm sure God can hear you even if you sing in your heart. <laughs> Spare me. The second thing this verse says is play skillfully. I cannot do that. Uh, I cannot sing or, or play any music and instruments skillfully, but I can shout for joy. So, so I'm glad that God has taught me to worship in two of these three ways. And, and what I do is when others play skillfully like the band did for us this morning, uh, I just enjoy and, and thank God for the gift of music that, uh, that um, he has given us. So as I was, I'm going to be sharing a little bit of my, about my story uh, this morning, my journey with Jesus. I'm going to be uh, also speaking from the Bible, but if this is your first time in a church, if you've never read the Bible, uh, it's absolutely fine. I'm going to be trying my best to explain everything to you. I'll give you all the context so you'll understand, um, uh, hopefully, everything that you're going to be talking about. Uh, this, this morning. I first discovered what true worship was in the year 1993 when my heart was captivated by Jesus. Why would they kill this man? He was only doing good. I see no fault in him. I remember thinking as I was reflecting on Jesus. I mean, he was healing the poor, he was helping people, he was teaching beautiful things. Why would they kill him? And as I began to understand that Jesus, God himself, the Son of God, died on the cross, taking the punishment for your sins and mine upon himself so that we could be forgiven, that's when I discovered worship. This was in the year 1993. I started working as a business journalist in the year 1994. And that was when my heart discovered ambition. I discovered worship in 93 and I discovered ambition in 94. Worship and ambition are remarkably similar but they are also dramatically different. Please don't hear me wrong. Ambition in itself is not a bad thing. There are two kinds of ambition. There is good and godly ambition. A couple of, couple of days ago, I was at the Startup Awards. I worked for a newspaper called The Economic Times, and I saw and met a lot of very successful businessmen. Narayan Murthy was there, Nandan was there, Sachin Bansal was there. And in that room, I saw a lot of good ambition. Their ambition has been a blessing to many people. So there is good godly ambition. But also in that room, what was very apparent to me and what has been very apparent to me over the last 20 years as I've been interviewing a lot of CEOs and businessmen and as I've been looking inwards within myself, 
there is also a lot of selfish ambition. So even the Bible qualifies ambition. In Philippians, which is a book in the New Testament, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is bad. So when I use the word ambition in this talk, especially when I contrast ambition and worship, I'm talking about selfish ambition. Ambition and worship are remarkably, remarkably similar, but they are dramatically different. Worship and ambition both captivate our souls. Worship and ambitions both have the power to motivate us. But that's where the similarity ends. Worship leads us to forget ourselves. Worship leads us to empty ourselves to receive God. Worship leads us to sacrifice ourselves. It inspires us to serve others. It inspires us to give and bring glory to God. Ambition, on the other hand, makes us self-centered. It lures us into using and abusing others. And ambition, selfish ambition, leads us on the path of confrontation with God himself. And so this morning, I want to talk about my struggles with, with ambition, selfish ambition. And as I share my story, I also want to look into the Bible. I want to be, I'm going to be talking about uh, a man who showed incredible ambition, incredibly selfish ambition throughout most of his life. He's a man named Jacob. And Jacob's life, much of his life, was a war between his desire to worship God and his desire to pursue his selfish ambition. I can relate to that. And I want to lead us into an exploration of the life of Jacob. So I guess most of us would know the story of his life, but for those of us who are exploring this morning, allow me to just give you a quick context, a quick background on the story before we uh, dive into it. Jacob was the younger son of, younger of twin brothers. He was born to a couple named Isaac and Rebekah. And his elder brother, his, uh, he was the younger of the two, his elder brother's name was Esau, and even though he was the younger brother, he was definitely the more, more ambitious of the two. Isaac was, was very wealthy, and Jacob being fiercely ambitious, wanted the birthright. He wanted the rights of being the eldest son. He wanted the inheritance. He wanted the honor of being the eldest son. And to achieve this, Jacob actually deceived his father Isaac when Isaac was on the deathbed. He dressed himself up like his elder brother, deceived and tricked and conned his father and took the blessing of the elder brother upon himself. Now Esau, the elder brother, discovered this and he was furious and he set out to kill Jacob. Jacob heard of this and he had to run away with absolutely nothing in his hand except a staff and he ran away to a distant country to escape the fury of his elder brother. And in this dist distant country, he meets this beautiful woman called Rachel and he, he falls in love, he falls in love with her. And, and then he, he pursues romance and love just as he pursued wealth and power, money and power. He pursues now romance and love, but after a while, even this ends up in, in disappointment. And so disappointed with this too, uh, he puts his head back into his career, becomes very successful, becomes very wealthy, and then the time comes when he decides to leave uh, Rachel's um, household, Rachel's country. And Rachel's father, who had by then employed Jacob, and Jacob was actually working for Rachel's father, he wouldn't let him go. So Jacob had to take his family and all his possessions and run away from him. And when he runs away, he has nowhere to go except to his, back to his father's home. And his elder brother Esau is waiting for him there. And he knows the next day on his journey, he comes to a place where he knows the next day morning, he is going to have to meet with his elder brother Esau. And he's really afraid that he's going to be murdered by his elder brother. So that night, Jacob spends the entire night wrestling with God in prayer. 
It is this passage that I want to just read for us and explore together as we reflect on the life of Jacob and I share my own story, my own journey of learning to forego selfish ambition and learning to worship Christ, Christ Jesus. I'm reading, uh, the verses will, will come up on screen for you. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 to 30. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. So Jacob that night was actually wrestling with God himself. This is a mysterious passage. Clearly, Jacob had wrestled with God and won. Can a mere man wrestle with God and win? Can a wicked man, can a deceitful man, can a crooked man, can a sinful man wrestle with God and win? I hope to answer that question for us this morning. I believe the answer will be very helpful to us. But allow me to just pray for a moment before we, we continue with this. And I, If this is, again, your first time, if you're an explorer, uh, allow me to encourage you to pray a very simple prayer. Jesus, if you're indeed God, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you teach me to, would you help me experience you? I think that's a great prayer, an open prayer to pray. And I want, you, I want to encourage you to pray that by yourself, even as I uh, pray for all of us. Father God, we thank you for your love over us. We thank you for your reckless love. We thank you that you gave yourself away to us. We thank you that you come after us. We thank you because you will never give up your pursuit of us. And so this morning we want to pray for those of us who are exploring God, exploring Jesus. Would you reveal yourself to us? For those of us who are followers of Jesus, would you, by your grace, enable us to grow more passionate, uh, to go... Uh, to grow more zealous in our love of you, in our life, in our living for you. We worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you haven't got a sense of it already, the life of Jacob is a battle between his love for money, power, romance, and sex on the one hand, and his love for God on the other hand. Does that sound familiar? I think all of us, as we live life in, in big cities, I live in Mumbai, and Bangalore is, is an equally big city, an equally sophisticated city. As we live lives in the city, these are things which will stare at us. These are things which will lure us. And I would, I, I'm willing to bet that every one of our lives is a battle. It's a battle between our love for money, power, uh, romance, and sex. And a battle between and our love for God. Money, power, romance, and sex. I've chased them all. And I bet you have too. These are all actually good things. Someone said that money is a, a good slave, but a bad master. Money has no character in itself. If you take a 2,000 rupee note and if you ask me, is it good or bad, it has no character in itself. It's how we use it. So these are all good things. Money is a good thing if we use it for good. Power, even power is a good thing because power can be used to help the weak and the oppressed. Romance, it's a beautiful thing. If you've ever been in love, 
you know what I'm talking about. The world looks completely different when we are in love. It's a beautiful thing. Sex, human sexuality was God's invention. He is the designer of human sexuality. He created it, but we corrupted it. In marriage, within the covenant of marriage, sex is a beautiful, a delightful gift from God to be enjoyed by the husband and wife. So all of these things are good things, and it's good to pursue these things. But the moment a pursuit of these things become more fierce, become more intense than a pursuit of God, then we are setting ourselves up for disappointment. This has been the story of my life over the last 20 years. This has been one great learning that nothing deserves our devotion more than God. Nothing deserves our pursuit more than God. Anything we love more than God has become an idol of the heart. Anything we love more than God has become a God substitute. You know, I've discovered that even ministry can become an idol. And I've been learning uh, to, to ensure that my heart is not more enthralled, my heart is not more captivated by ministry doing things in the church than it is with Jesus. Jesus is the first love of my life. And that should never change. When I use the word idol, I'm talking about idols of the heart, things that during different seasons in our lives, we all love more than we love God. And so our, from the passage that I read for us this morning, I want us to draw, I want to draw three things for us. The first thing I'd like to draw is idols are always elusive. You'll see that from Jacob's life and I'll share some of my uh, own journey too. The second thing I want to draw for us from the passage is when one idol eludes us, we often start pursuing another idol. And the third thing that I want to draw, please allow me to just keep that in suspense till the end. I'll, I'll, I'll share that as we come to a close. Let's jump in. The first thing I want to share is that idols are always elusive. And I want to talk a little bit about these four idols that we're talking about, money, power, romance, and sex. Jacob's pursuit of money left him deeply disappointed. He deceived his father and he got it all. But what happened? The very next day or soon thereafter, he had to run away, leaving all of that. In the new country, with when working for Rachel's, Rachel's dad, he earned a lot of money, uh, and, but he had to run away in, in, in the night without honor, without respect. And he got all the money he earned from Laban, but when he actually goes to meet Esau, he gives away a lot of that money to appease Esau. So Jacob's pursuit of money actually came, came to naught. And I remember, I vividly remember the ambition of my youth. I started working in 1994, and the pursuit and the accumulation of money was so uh, deep inside of me. I wanted to be wealthy and powerful. I wanted to earn more and more money. That in itself is not a bad thing, because there are many good things we could do. But I know my heart and my, all my motive for the pursuit of money was entirely selfish. I became so obsessed, this is perhaps the year 2000, I became so obsessed with my pursuit of my money and career that for one full year, I never went to church. Worship of God became a distant, low priority on my life. And I remember through that one year, I gave not a single penny away to anyone. I was accumulating all of it. As I look back at that season in my life, I can see that that accumulation, that selfish pursuit of money got me nowhere. Financially, we were always struggling. At that point in time in my life, I remember my wife and I look back at it and joke about our folly, our foolishness at that point of time. Now, we had every single loan that was available in the market. It took us time and, and many hardship to understand, and we took the relentless love of God to draw me away from the pursuit of money into the pursuit of Jesus first and foremost. As I look back a few months ago, 
my wife and I, we took a decision. We are planting a church in Mumbai, and we took a decision. We felt God call us to work less so we could spend more time with God. So a few months ago, we took the decision, and I now work only two days a week for the Economic Times. I work as a consultant, and in the process of taking the decision, I had to take a 50% cut in my salary. God gave us the faith to do that, and a few months later, as we look back, we're fi we've been financially more blessed when we put Jesus first and gave up money, the kingdom of God, the ways of Jesus are always upside down. They are counterintuitive. When we pursue Jesus first, everything else will be added unto us. The second idol of Jacob, and I have to confess, it was a very strong idol in my own life too, was the idolatry of power. Jacob's aim of stealing the birthright was not just about money and wealth. It was also about Power, Because in that culture, and I guess it's true uh, in many of our cultures too, the firstborn, the firstborn son was very special. The family name came to him, the family honor came to him, and he was the boss. And I, I imagine Jacob desiring, desiring this. And so all the, the deceit he gave him to was all in the pursuit of power and honor. But where did that pursuit of power lead Jacob to? He spent many years away, and when he came back eventually to his family, he came groveling before Esau. The word grovel in the dictionary is defined like this, lie or crawl abjectly on the ground with one's face downwards. That was the posture in which Jacob eventually approached Esau. The pursuit of power left Jacob deeply disappointed. It took me a long time to realize this, but I began to understand at some point of time that the pursuit of career success is also the pursuit of power. I realized early on in my career that when I become the boss man, when I have people reporting to me, I have power over them. And as I became more and more successful in my career, I began to see my own vulnerability, my own wickedness in handling this power over other people. I, I didn't abuse power. I didn't abuse my power to hurt and harm other people. So I thought I was okay for some time, but it took me a while to realize that I was actually using people so that I could get ahead in my career. I began to see that I was actually manipulating people so I could get ahead in my career. Their desires, their hopes, their families, their needs, their feelings, none of it mattered. I was blind to all of that. All that mattered to me in that season in my life was the pursuit of power. And I was using them, manipulating them. I was totally uncaring about them. I was just, I just wanted to get ahead in life. Power made me proud. Power made me arrogant. Power made me unmindful of God. And the sense of this earthly, worldly career power created in my soul a less and less and less dependency on God. Truth be told, this risk is very real even in ministry. As I, you know, as we experience success, even in church ministry, it is very probable because of our sinfulness that we might actually start relying more on the power of ministry, on the success of ministry, than on, the, on, on, on Jesus. Jacob's power, pursuit of power, took him nowhere, and it took me too to a, to a dead end. The third idol that I want to talk about is the idolatry of romance. Jacob was hopelessly in love with Rachel. But Rachel's dad, Laban, was a very shrewd man. He saw that Jacob was pretty good at shepherding. That was the career of, of Jacob. That's what Laban was, was doing too. So when uh, Jacob went to Laban and said, can I marry your daughter? And Laban said, sure, you can marry my daughter, but... Uh, you'll have to work for it for seven years. So at the end of seven years, Laban tricks Jacob and gives Leah, in, uh, the elder daughter, into, in, uh, in marriage to Jacob. Now, Leah, unlike Rachel, was 
not at all pretty. She was not at all beautiful. Jacob, of course, is furious. He goes back to Laban, and then Laban gives, uh, uh, you know, an excuse, and he says, work another seven years. Uh, I'll give you Rachel in marriage, also, Rachel also in marriage, but work for me for another seven years. So Jacob ended up working for 14 years uh, for, for, uh, for Rachel, and he was deeply in love. We're going to be talking a little bit more about that in just a bit. This honeymoon with Rachel eventually came to an end. All this love, he was hopelessly head over in heels in love. But there came a time when the romance vanished. Rachel was unable to bear children. And she was hurt. She was in agony. She was in pain. She was deeply disappointed. And she expressed her disappointment to Jacob, her husband, and Jacob's response is sad. The Bible says that Jacob became furious with Rachel. Jacob became angry with Rachel. There was no tenderness in him. Where has all the romance gone? It vanished. I don't know if you've seen this movie called Alaipayude in Tamil or, or I think it was Satya in Hindi. It's, it's, a, it's a great romantic story, but, but the, the, the movie kind of depicts how romance also can wear thin if Jesus is not at the center. You know, my wife and I, we keep reminding ourselves, each other, very often at this. You know, at, at very special moments, at, you know, at times together, when you're on a, on a date or just enjoying our time together, we would look deep into each other's eyes. And she would tell me, Anand, you're not my first love. Jesus is. And I would tell her, of course, darling, you are not my first love. Jesus is. Even the pursuit of romance and marriage comes second. So Jacob's idolatry, pursuit of romance didn't lead him anywhere. In all the season, if you read through the book of Genesis, the second part of Genesis, Jacob, there is absolutely no mention of Jacob seeking God. Absolutely no mention. The fourth idolatry of Jacob that I want to talk about is the idolatry of sex. Jacob was not just romantically obsessed with Rachel, he was also longing in his sexual desire for her. At the end of the seven years of labor, this is what Jacob tells uh, his future father-in-law, Laban. You can read that in Genesis chapter 29, verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, my time is completed, I want to make love to her. Don't be shocked, this I'm reading from the Bible. This is insane. I mean, I can think of a thousand things a man could tell his potential father-in-law. I'll take care of your daughter. I, I will treat her special. She will always be special. I will care for her. Look at my uh, finances or professional life or whatever. I, I, I'm capable. I have the capacity to care for her. I cannot imagine for the life of me in any culture... A man walking up to his prospective father-in-law, give me your daughter, give, me her, give her to me as my wife, I want to make love to her. I would imagine that Bible translators would have had a really hard time translating this. Uh, you know, the Bible was originally written in different languages, it was translated into English for us. If the language in the original was anything remotely romantic and not sexual... I would imagine the Bible translators would have used a romantic thing. Give me my wife. I'm hopelessly in love with her. They would have translated it like that. If Bible translators have translated it into saying, I want to make love to her, the original must have been pretty graphic in expressing Jacob's sexual desire and longing for, for Rachel. And at this point in time, uh, Laban says, yes, you can marry him. Maybe they had, sorry, maybe they had a, a, a big party that night. Maybe there was a lot of alcohol flowing. The Bible doesn't say anything. But all we know is Jacob could not recognize the woman he was marrying because Laban tricked him into marrying Leah. And the Bible says, in the morning, there was Leah. Jacob, after the wedding festivities, after the wedding night, he woke up in the morning and there was Leah, not Rachel. Now, there's a man named Tim Keller. He's a pastor in New York. In one of his sermons, this is what he says. In the morning, there is always Leah. In the morning, there is always Leah. It doesn't matter which beautiful idol we slept with. When we wake up in the morning, 
when our idolatry has run its course, when we have been deceived by the idolatry of the heart in the morning, there is always ugly Leah. Money, power, romance, sex, they're all good friends to have. They are terrible lovers. The only true lover of our soul, the only true lover of our soul is Christ Jesus. Let me come back to the idolatry of sex. And I want to take a moment to just speak to parents. It is so important that we start teaching and speaking to our children about God's gift of sexuality. I struggled with the idolatry of sex for many, many, many years. Even after I got married, even after I became a believer, my wife was, was so kind and forgiving. She was so gracious to me. All of those struggles because my foundations of human sexuality was all wrong. And I take great pains. I have two children, 14 and 11. I take great pains. I, I, I've been talking to my son about sex and my daughter too from the time they were four or five years old in what is appropriate for that age. And we want to affirm, we need to affirm to our children that sexuality is a beautiful, good gift from God. But it is only in the context of marriage that it becomes beautiful. That is only in the context of marriage that it is a gift. Otherwise, it is a curse outside of the context of marriage. I, I'm sure you're going to agree with what I'm going to say now. Few things in this world can make us more feel more beautiful, can make us feel more loved than sex within a marriage, than sex within the beautiful covenant of marriage. In the same breath, I can also say that nothing makes us feel more dirty. Nothing makes us feel more cheap. Nothing makes us feel more unworthy than sex outside the covenant of marriage. Jacob's idolatry of sex, his sexual longing for Rachel also took him to, an, to a dead end. He didn't really fulfill him. Idols are always elusive. How many of us have tried to grasp water? It doesn't matter if you're grasping water, you know, that's spilled over here. It doesn't matter if you're grasping water from a bottle. It doesn't matter if you're grasping water from a bucket. It doesn't matter if you're grasping water from a swimming pool. It doesn't matter if you're grasping water from the ocean. We can never get hold of water. All that we have at the end of it when we grasp water is just a little wetness in our hands. Idols are always elusive. The idols of our heart seduce us, but they always elude us. The second thing that I want to draw from the passage is simply this. When one idol eludes us, we often begin an equally unfulfilling pursuit of another idol. When one idol disappoints us, we merely turn our devotion to another equally unfulfilling idol. We see that in the life of Jacob. He started with the idolatry of wealth and power. Where did it take him? Nowhere. He had to run away a pauper with nothing, as the Bible says, except a staff in his hand. And rather than turn to God, repent and turn to God, even though he has an encounter with God as he's running away, we won't talk about that today. Despite that, Jacob merely turns to another idol for comfort. The Bible says when he actually met Rachel, he wept before her. He's looking for comfort in the idolatry of romance. He's hoping that his disappointments in the idolatry of money and power will be healed by his pursuit of the idolatry of romance and sex. So he moved from one idolatry to, to another. And there came a time when, when the idolatry of romance and sex also failed him. You know, there was incredible conflict about between Rachel and, and, and Leah, and, and, and that didn't lead him anywhere to. Again, instead of turning to God, he turned again to the idolatry of the career. We see that he, he put his heart and soul into working for Laban, and he kind of multiplied the sheep, and he was very successful. 
but his, ex his experience of short-term, temporary success took away his need for God. He took away his love for God. I struggle with this. I'm more afraid of success than I'm afraid of failures. There are times, and this is true in my work life, this is true in church planting. There are times when I pray, God, let me fail. Because it's, as I look back at my journey over the last 20 years as a follower of Jesus, 23, 24 years as a follower of Jesus, the most beautiful moments of intimacy with God that I've had have been in times of suffering, disappointment, and failure. I don't know about you. In my, in my success, I don't go to God all that much. There are many times when I pray, God, let me fail. I need you. I need you more than any of these idols. And Jacob moved from one idol to other. Eventually, he just moved to the idolatry of Korea. Until the time came when God decides he needs to bring Jacob back. And Jacob, and that's the third thing that I want to draw for us. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So Jacob is now in a place where he's ran away from Laban with his family, with his wealth. Wealth in those days was basically flock and cattle. He's run away, and he's going to meet Esau. And the place where he was in is not a happy place. It's not a safe place anymore because Laban is actually becoming jealous of Jacob's success. So he has to run away. And the place he's going to is a place where he could potentially be murdered in the morning when he meets his elder brother Esau. So that night when there is nowhere else to go, no idolatry left to pursue, Jacob finally turns to God. He wrestles with God in prayer. Unless you bless me, I will not let you go. Jacob cried out to God. We saw in the passage that we read that Jacob wrestled with God and he won. This is mysterious. Everything in Jacob's life so far tells us he is a man to be despised. He is a man to be hated. He has done some despicable things in his life. And God ought to have crushed him. God ought to have punished him and sent him to hell immediately when he came, comes into the presence of God. How could a crooked, wretched, sinful man wrestle with God himself and prevail? Think about this. This is, this is pretty deep. Think about this. All his life, Jacob was pursuing one idol after the other. Money, power, romance, sex. He was pursuing one idol after the other. He could not get his hands around any of these idols. Jacob never managed to grasp any of the idols that he pursued in his life, but that by Jacob managed to grasp God. Jacob managed to wrestle with God and prevail. Think about the blessed irony of this. When we chase our idols, we can never get hold of them. But us, in all our sinfulness, in all our failings, all our failures, like Jacob, we can get our arms around God. Because as we sung this morning, he gives himself to us. His love is a reckless love. He gives himself to us. Jacob could never grasp any idol he chased, but he could get his arms around God and say, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. This, my friends, is the grace of God in the flaws of men. Allow me to just dwell on this a little bit more. There are only two possibilities here. The first possibility is that Jacob was indeed stronger than God. We all know that's not true. The second possibility is that God feigned weakness and allowed Jacob to overpower him. 
obviously the second is true. God feigned weakness and allowed Jacob to overpower him. In wrestling, there's something called as a death grip. When you've pinned your opponent down, and once you've got a death grip on your opponent, you won the match. Did Jacob get a death grip on God? How did God allow Jacob to hold him in a death grip? Every one of us who believe in Jesus, we once held Jesus in a death grip on the cross. And we held Jesus on a death grip on the cross. Our sins held Jesus on a death grip on the cross only because God allowed it. Our sins don't deserve the death of our Savior. But the love of God, the reckless love of God, made him throw away his son Jesus, made him offer his son as a sacrifice so that we, you and I, sinful, weak, vulnerable, failures can be loved and accepted by God. You know, my son likes to watch wrestling a little bit. I think it's now called WWE. It used to be called WWF or whatever it is. And he keeps talking to me about signature moves. Every wrestler of any repute has a signature move. When he brings out a signature move, the battle is won. God's signature move was the cross. On the cross, Christ Jesus, who was God himself, who was the son of God, took the weight of our sin, of your sin and mine, upon him. And Jesus became weak under the weight of our sin. As Jesus carried all of our sins upon himself, nailed to the cross, the full fury of a holy God, the, the justice of a true and virtuous and righteous God came upon Jesus. And Jesus took all the punishment of God that is due on you and me upon himself so that when God looks at us, he can always look at us in love, never in anger. Because all of the anger and fury of God for your sins and mine has already been poured out on Christ Jesus. And Jesus rose again from the dead and his resurrection is proof that our sin has been paid for. The sentence has been served. Punishment has been fully dealt with. And in Jesus we no longer need to fear punishment of God. We can come back to God. We can be reconciled with God. We can enjoy God. All our lives, we can never chase and get any idol, but we can get the fullness of God himself because he gives himself to us. Allow me to articulate one objection many of us who are explorers of Jesus have with Christianity and with Christians. I know everybody loves Christians. Christians do some very good things. They build wonderful schools, hospitals. We love serving the poor. And when you as explorers look at Christians, you like them because they're basically good people. They're kind people. They've been serving everywhere they go, wherever we've been serving, and you like that. But you have only one problem with Christians. The problem you have with Christians is they believe that Jesus is the only way to God. They believe in the exclusivity of Jesus. That's what puts you off with Christians. You like everything else about him. So that's probably a stumbling block for those of you who are just exploring Jesus this morning. Allow me to, to, to just share with us why we believe that. I think I've been talking about that all along, but let me just explain that. Let me sh uh, dwell on that just a little bit more. I'll try my best to explain my heart to you. And I'm going to use an illustration to explain this to us. I'm going to talk to men and I'm going to talk to women. Uh, let me talk to men first. Imagine you're going to a wedding and you've picked out a beautiful white linen shirt, 6,000 rupees. You've just bought it online on an Amazon sale. It was 6,000 rupee, 6, rupees after the sale. Beautiful white linen dress you bought specially for the uh, wedding. Linen shirt, white, spotless white. 
you wear that shirt and you're ready to go for the wedding, go attend the wedding, you feel a little hungry. And you know this friends whose wedding you're going to, they're forever late. You know dinner's going to be delayed, so you decide to have a quick bite. You open the fridge, there's some butter chicken, you just take a spoon and, and have a couple of mouthfuls, but a small piece of butter chicken gravy, bright red in color, has fallen on your white linen shirt. It's maybe just, just a small stain, maybe the size of a five rupee coin. It's just 1% of the surface area of, of your white shirt. 99% of your shirt is still white. Only 1% right here has a butter chicken stain. How many of you would go to a wedding wearing that shirt? No one. I enjoy watching my wife apply makeup. So I'm talking to women now. Now imagine you're, you're, you're applying your eyeliner or your kajal. And, and, and my wife kind of shapes her eye more than what her eye is with the kajal. And I, I always keep getting lost into her eyes. Now, I, I want you to imagine I want you to imagine that you're applying an eyeliner and you're also going to the wedding, you're dressed up ready, you're wearing an eyeliner, and you find that the, 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 the extra thing that comes out here, I don't know what you call it, uh, on the right side is about four millimeters longer than the, than the extension on the left eye. You can see it clearly. That four millimeters is a mile long. How many of you would go to the wedding with a four millimeter long eyeliner on one eye? I bet no woman would. She'll make sure, and my wife does, she'll make sure that it's corrected. Why would we not go to weddings like that? Deep inside, every one of us, whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're not a follower of Jesus, every one of us, deep inside, we have a longing for perfection. Perfection is a modern secular word for the word holiness. Deep inside, you and I, all of us, have a longing for holiness. We don't understand it. We have a desire to be perfect. We have a desire to be good and beautiful. How much more will God desire a perfect, beautiful, sinless, holy God how much more will he desire perfection in us? If you and I cannot tolerate a butter chicken stain that covers just 1% of our white shirt, even though 99% of our shirt is still pure white, how can we expect God to accept us even if we have one stain of sin in us? God wants to spend eternity with us. He cannot tolerate, a holy God cannot tolerate imperfection, just as we cannot tolerate imperfection. That's why we believe Jesus is the only way to God. I have understood, I have studied and understood Hindu mythology quite deeply. And I have some understanding of some religious cultures across, across the world. In no religious construct has a man been born of a virgin. In no religious construct has a man been tempted in every way and yet was without sin. Only Jesus was. No other religion claims of any of its religious leaders that they were without sin. Only Jesus was without sin. He was pure. He was perfect. And he could have, as a man, the life he lived, he was the only one who earned the right to spend eternity with God because he was perfect in all his ways, just as God was perfect. And so God should have said, Jesus, my son, you've lived a good life as a man. Come on and come on to heaven and spend the rest of eternity with me. But that's not what God did because as we sung, God is reckless in his love. He was so reckless that he laid Jesus, the only perfect man, on the cross. And there was this beautiful divine exchange that happened on the cross. Our sin, our stains, our ugliness was heaped on Jesus. And his righteousness was stripped away from him and was given to us. Not by force, but Jesus joyfully, sacrificially gave himself up. That's why we believe Jesus is the only way to God because he is 
God himself who died to make us holy. Allow me to close in prayer and then I'll request Pastor Ashish to come up. And if you're an explorer of Jesus, if, if you're falling in love with Jesus, and that's the way I would describe coming to believe in Jesus. That's how it happened for me. I fell in love with this Jesus. If you're falling in love with Jesus, as I pray, I would encourage you, would you lay your hands on your heart and say, Jesus, help me know you. Help me believe in you. Help me experience you. And maybe others will come and I'm sure they'll have things to share with you. Be open to all of that. If, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, I want to lead us in a little bit of repentance. We all love in different seasons of our life. We all slip into loving other things more than we love Jesus. You know what those are in your life. I know what those are in my life. And could we surrender? Just ask God to pray that the passions of our heart, the devotions of our heart, the worship of our soul would go only to Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for your reckless love. We run after our idols. We can never get them. But you give yourself to us, Lord. You allowed Jacob to wrestle with you and win. When he'd spent a lifetime failing in his pursuit of idols. When Jacob was pursuing his idols, you pursued him. When I was pursuing my idols, you pursued me, Jesus. We pray for those of us who are exploring Jesus. Holy Spirit of God, how can any of us come to believe in you unless you step in? So we pray, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, would you step in? Would you help those of us who are exploring Jesus to fall in love with Jesus? Bring forth, birth faith in our hearts, Lord. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, we come before you in worship. We come before you in repentance. Oh, we have considered other things more beautiful than you, Jesus. We've desired other things more than you. You know what, Lord? We repent. Thank you this morning for reminding us that Jesus is the true lover of our souls. In the morning, Jesus, only Jesus, will be beautiful. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you'd fill us with great devotion for Christ over everything else. Fill us with great passion for Jesus over everything else. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Anand. Can I just have the worship team up here, please? And uh, Why don't we just stand up to our feet for a few moments? And uh, even as Anand has placed before us a challenge, an invitation. I want us to just take a few moments to respond to that. And this morning, there could be two kinds of people that we just want to pray with and invite to respond. Maybe you've come here and after hearing what Anna shared with us, you feel in your heart that you want to take that step to believe in Jesus and begin this journey with Jesus, getting to know him more and more and letting him change you, lead you, guide you. If you feel that in your heart, then we just want to lead you in a prayer. Or maybe... You at one point, some point in your life, you had made a decision for Christ and then just drifted away. But this morning you're here and you feel in your heart. I want to go back to that place where it all began with Jesus. And I want to start once again. If you relate to each of these positions and this morning you would like to make a prayer and make a commitment to Christ. I want to lead us in a prayer and just help you make that decision before we dismiss. So could we just bow our heads, please? And anyone here this morning? 
you feel in your heart, I want to do this. I want to let Jesus take control. Whether it's going to be the first time in your life or whether you've drifted a bit and you want to come back, but you feel you want to do that. without any compulsion because you want to do it i want to invite you to just pray this prayer with me just say this with me lord jesus come into my life forgive my sins and help me follow you and you alone the rest of my life make everything new give me meaning give me purpose and show me the way and i pray this in jesus name amen Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this amazing day and this amazing morning. Thank you for what has happened in our hearts as we've been in your presence. Thank you for these people who prayed and and what's taken place inside them. We thank you for it. And God, we just commit ourselves to you. As we go, as we dismiss, we pray that we'll just continue to enjoy your presence and continue to enjoy one another. Thank you once again in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact@apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.